morning everybody and uh, welcome to well not church at home this morning we church from the mountain and uh, welcome to God's creation welcome to a, a beautiful place like like this and we privileged to be able to be planted here in the Yaldeberg in an environment that is uh, just speaking about God's beauty speaking about God's majesty and his grandeur and it is awe-inspiring to be up here to be able to have a look and see some of the west stretched out there behind me and then towards the ocean we see Strand and Gordon's Bay and Solaris Pass village over here just amazing Sunda village behind me next to the N2 and all the way up to the Table Mountain it's amazing to have this perspective to to see the beauty of what God has created, to see the, the purpose that God has for all of this area, this Yaldeberg Basin, to be to the glory of His name, to reflect something of who He is. And, you know, as I was just driving up here and, and we were setting up, I was just once again just so overwhelmed and overawed by God's love for us. You know that he places us here he surrounds us with with nature and with the beauty of creation and he surrounds us with people as well because he wants to spoil us he wants to um, have us experience his heart and he wants us to know that he is good and um, this whole scene this this pulpit this morning this little wall where i'm sitting is my is my pulpit the baboons are, are the audience, they might respond to the altar call, I, I don't know, we've, we've got to see. But uh, just to realize once again that the church is everywhere, isn't it? Church is where, where God's people are. And this space, you know, we, we got here and some rubbish lying around in the midst of the beauty of creation. And there's always this, this element of, of humanity that, that uh, almost in a way intrudes in the original purpose that God had but as we as we come here we consecrate this ground to to the Lord's purposes and and this is holy ground now here where I'm sitting I'm sitting at the foot of the cross you guys will see this this picture right here and uh, this cross reflects and 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 shines and casts its shadow all across the basin and that is what the cross of Jesus does uh, irrespective of where we are right now, where we might find ourselves, the cross of Jesus still stands and still speaks over our lives. And, and I want to, in the light of this beautiful scenery and in the light of that reality of the cross, uh, I want to read for us again a, a portion that I read a couple of weeks ago. And I just want the, the truth and the power of, of these words to wash over you, wherever you might be right now as you as you listen to this morning's message. But first, let me pray for all of us. Father, thank you, God, that you are a good Father. Thank you, God, that you love us so much that you have planted and placed us here in the Yaldeberg, Lord, this beautiful environment where we have these awe-inspiring mountains. We have the ocean. We have nature around us, God, and it just shouts of your glory. And we are reminded, Lord, of your words, Jesus, that uh, if we were to keep silent, then the rocks, and nature would cry out. And as we have worshipped you this morning, Lord, we, we also understand that, that you have placed something in us that yearns to break free in worship to you. And I pray, God, that each one of us, that we will, that we will open our hearts, open our mouths, and allow that unction that lives inside of us just to be released through us, Lord, as a shout of praise to you. Our lives are living sacrifice unto you. Be glorified through this message this morning. Lord, touch every heart. You know where everyone is at. Touch every heart. Holy Spirit, by your hand, in Jesus' name, amen. So let me read for you guys again from, from Ephesians, um, the first chapter, and from verse 15. I'm going to read this for us slowly and just trusting God that the words will again just wash over us. 
Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling, what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of His power toward us who believe, according to the working of His mighty power, which He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And um, the last time I spoke to you, I spoke to you about the power of God's calling. We spoke to each other about the fact that uh, God desires us right now within our, our changing circumstances to have the eyes of our understanding opened, to have it enlightened. As, as I'm sitting here right now, we have the sun shining down on us while we're doing this recording. It's a glorious, it's a beautiful day right now. The sun is shining and where the sun is shining, there's light, uh, there's perspective, there's clarity. And, and, and Paul prays that for his friends. He prays that their understanding would be an enlightened. Now that word understanding in the Greek, it's the word dionia. Dionia, and I just want to read the definition for you from Strong's Concordance. It says that the word dionia combines nous, which means mind, and dia or dia, which means through. And the word suggests understanding, insight, meditation, reflection, perception, the gift of apprehension, the faculty of thought. When this faculty is renewed by the Holy Spirit, the whole mindset changes from the fearful negativism of the carnal mind to the vibrant, positive thinking of the quickened spiritual mind. The understanding, the perception, the grasping of the reality is enlightened by the Holy Spirit. So in a very real sense, what I want you to imagine is your, is your mind being invaded by the light of the Holy Spirit. Uh, earlier at the beginning of the year, we spoke to each other about uh, questions and then we spoke about 2020 questions. What might be some of the questions that we have at the beginning of the year, that we have at the beginning of a brand new year? And we looked at some of the questions that people googled and they searched and we said that the, the, uh, the curiosity of man, the need for knowledge has given birth to a billion dollar industry that the entire internet runs on man's need and his question, and his thirst for knowledge, for understanding, really. And so there were some very interesting questions that were Googled last year. And, and we spoke to one another about some of them, and we asked each other some questions. You know, some of those questions were, what will the economy be doing in this year? Um, what will, uh, when will load shedding end? It was one of the questions we were asking. You know, I personally asked, will Liverpool win the Premier League in 2020? Will this be... Liverpool's year and of course the answer to that was yes a resounding yes praise Jesus a resounding yes but there are so many more questions that have been added to that and I think from January to now it will be interesting for you to maybe just think to yourself what were my questions then what were my thoughts then what were some of my concerns some of my fears some of my dreams then and I as I've been just journeying with people, visiting people and, and chatting to people, you know, there are a few questions that, that I realize many of us are struggling with and, and I just listed a few of them here. Um, again, load shedding is still with us. When will load shedding end? We, we don't know. We, we don't have the answer to that. And it impacts upon people's businesses. It impacts upon people's financial future. Uh, it impacts upon their well-being. It impacts upon their social life. Um, when will things return to normal again and what will normal look like? School, sports, a church, 
you know, when will things get back to normal so that we can just continue to do what we want to do? Uh, some people are having to consider about uh, 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 what's a safe place for my kids. Where do I raise my kids? Where do I buy a house? Where is it safe for my kids to grow up? Is there such a place here in the basin? Is there such a place here in South Africa? Or should I be looking somewhere else to answer that question? Uh, some dear friends of ours have lost fathers, mothers, brothers, uncles, here within our very own congregation. And their question is, when will my grieving heart heal again? How do I go on with this missing part of my life, this person who isn't with me anymore? Does God still have a plan for me? Some are having to navigate through that question. I did some things I'm not proud of. I, I, I thought some things I'm not proud of. I... I made promises and broke them. I gave up on people that I promised I would stick with them. Does God still have a purpose for my life? Does He still have a plan for my life? Because the promises didn't come true the way I thought that they would. Does God still have a plan for me? Or did this changing environment mess up those plans? I chatted with some people and they, and they said they're having to deal with the reality that the people they thought were their friends, now there are big question marks over those friendships. Are they still my friends? Now that we are not gathering at church anymore on a Sunday, are they still my friends? And some guys are wrestling with a very big question is, when will we see the Springboks playing again? Each one of us have got different questions and maybe some of your questions I mentioned now, I look forward to come to visit you and spend time with you so I can get to know what are some of the questions on your heart. And, and by the way, thank you so much for answering. I love what this, this definition says. It says that we move away from the negativism of the carnal mind and it's easy to be sucked into negativity. But when our minds are open for the light of the Holy Spirit to bring understanding, He translates us into a different way of thinking, into the vibrant positive thinking of the quickened spiritual mind. To be, to be quickened means to be made alive. And you know, Romans uh, 12 says it so beautifully, the difference between the carnal mind and the, and the spiritual mind. And I want to remind us of that this morning. And Paul says in Romans 12 verse 2, do not be conformed to this world. In other words, don't allow the thinking of the world and the patterns of the world and the pressure of the world that, that the tidal pool of negativity, the tidal pool of um, disillusionment and of fear and of anger and rebellion and lawlessness, don't allow that to push you into a certain shape, into a box. Do not be conformed. It speaks about a straight jacket that gets placed upon you from the outside and says, don't, don't allow yourself to be conformed, but be transformed, be renewed, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And I love that. It's not by the removal of your mind, but by the renewal of your mind. That by testing, by experiencing, in other words, not just through theoretical knowledge, but by testing, taste and see that the Lord is good. God has always wanted us to experience Him. He has never wanted us to know Him from a distance. He is he's a God that, that is beyond creation and has perspective beyond time, but at the same time has chosen to dwell within creation through man, through His Son that, that was incarnated. And so He's with us, He's Emmanuel, He's intimate with us, and He wants us to experience Him and He wants us to discern what is the good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. And so if we want to know what is God's will for us in this time, and all of these questions that we have been thinking about, and I want to encourage you to make your own list and to write that down and to invite the spirit of understanding into that list. Because the worst thing that we can try to do right now is to figure those things out by ourselves. We, we need the spirit of understanding more than ever before. But we need that and we are going to get to a place of understanding God's will, God's good will, 
God's acceptable will, God's perfect will, the fullness of His will. We're going to experience that only through one way. And that is through renewing our mind. You know, and so for me, I realized that, that over these last few months, there were some thought patterns, there were some, some stuff that I allowed to become strongholds in my life, ways that I've been doing life and I've been thinking about myself and those around me and my neighborhood and this beautiful environment in which God has placed us. And I've been challenged on those things and I've had to repent, which means I had to change my way of thinking and as I change my way of thinking, I can change my way of doing. And so I want to ask you, what are the thought patterns that God has been challenging you on? Uh, don't just rush into this next phase of, of, of your life, but think about what are the thought patterns that you were challenged upon. You know, Mark 12 verse 29, and we spoke about this at the beginning of the year. We said there are a lot of things that we don't know. And a lot of things about God's will. God, is this your acceptable will? In other words, are you, are you just allowing this? But it's not really your good will. You know, there's something more. You know, God, is this your good will? But this isn't your perfect will. In other words, there's something even better that you have for me. And, you know, sometimes God allows things in our lives. And He works those things together for our good. But we're not in the sweet spot of His will. And God wants us to... To, to move into that sweet spot. And, and you will have areas in your life, I've got areas in my life, where I'm in the sweet spot, man. I'm there, I'm obedient, I'm, 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 I'm following the footsteps of Jesus. And then there's some other areas where it's a bit murky, it's a bit, bit dark. I, I, I'm, I'm figuring this out as I'm going along. But the beautiful thing is, as I'm allowing the Word of God and the Spirit of God to renew my thinking, I'm tasting God's will. I'm, I'm growing in His will. But there are certain things that we don't have to wonder. You know, with all of these questions we are considering, all the permutations, and it impacts you as an individual, as a, as a single person, as you are having to navigate through your questions at home as a young family, maybe you've just fallen pregnant or, or maybe your child has just been born or, or maybe your children have left the house. And you're having to navigate through a whole bunch of questions and God's will is being progressively revealed to you. And so some things aren't that clear. There are a few things that are abundantly clear to us in Scripture, which we don't have to wonder about, which we don't have to debate, which we don't have to do a survey about, we don't have to do a poll, we don't have to do research on the internet about that, because God has made that clear in His Word. And Mark 12 verse 29, then says that Jesus answered him, The first of the commandments is this, Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And it says this is the acceptable, the pleasing, the good, the perfect will of God. Just love Him. Man, in your questions, in your struggle, love God. Make that your ultimate aim. Love Him with every fiber in your being. Love Him. And then he goes on to say, this is the first commandment and the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There are no greater commandments than these. Love God with everything inside of you. Love Him, every atom inside of your being. Love Him and then in the same way, the same breath with which you worship God, love your neighbor as yourself. You know, and so I believe that part of the understanding that God is wanting to give us is as we are figuring out the future, as we are figuring out the new normal, as we are figuring out how do we as a family do school life now with, with different hours of schooling and we're not able to do all the extramurals. Our friendships are slowly picking up again. and Some friendships maybe, maybe were damaged or lost and others have been started and we navigating through how do I rebuild my business? How do, I, how do I get new clients? How do I win back some of the other clients? How do I uh, make new partnerships with maybe people who were my competitors are now my partners and we need to work together, which is a beautiful thing that God is doing within His kingdom. 
So many of us as pastors, we're just beginning to work together in such a beautiful way. It's incredible. And I chatted to one of our businessmen in church and he says he's experiencing the same thing. Guys who were his competitors are now his partners. They're working together and they're stronger together. But wherever you might be within that figuring out, as we as elders, we're figuring out. So God, you know, will we use the school staff room? And will we do live services and stream it at the same time? Will we send a video recording and, and uh, do the live service? How will we do all of those things? And, and, and how will we continue to disciple and continue to create environments where we can come together? But in the midst of all the uncertainty, what we really need to be figuring out, or, or rather what we need to just be obedient to, this is loving God and loving our neighbors. And so for me, I shared with you a while ago, man, I miss church. I miss just being with you. I miss worshiping God with you because as incredible as it is to worship on my own at home or with my family, there's something that happens when we come together corporately. There's the Spirit of God is there in a way that is just, man, it just brings me to tears because I know we're different. We come from different backgrounds and environments, but we are in God's presence together as a family. And this is a taste of heaven where we won't be in our little homes by ourselves, but we will be together around the throne. And so why gather again when the opportunity is there? Because it is prophetic. <laughs> It is a little glimpse of heaven. That's why we're doing it, because God has called us to be a community. Community. But at the same time, you know, I've been wrestling just with this. Lord, how do I now love my neighbors? And so just for me, God has been just challenging me and saying, Heinrich, and so you've made Sunday a big deal. And it's right, it needs to be a big deal. But I'm wanting to just nudge you towards your neighbors again. And, and so I've, 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 I've joined a neighborhood to watch a WhatsApp group and we're discussing things and I'm, and I'm getting to know people who have an amazing heart for our community. Just men and women just like us. They just want to see their children safe. They just want to see their community safe. We're not all born again believers, but we desire the same thing. And, and now I'm busy with some other amazing people coordinating patrols and doing training and I'm getting to know people for the first time. Oh, this, this last week and a half, I've gotten to know more people than I did in almost three years that we have been living in that house. And I'm thinking, Jesus, it took a lockdown for me to just be obedient to loving my neighbor. Because how can I love my neighbor if I don't even know my neighbor? I mean, come on, who am I kidding? Can I say that I love my neighbors and I don't even know them? I don't even know what they do. I don't even know where they work. I don't even know the names of their kids. Come on, who am I kidding? <laughs> My neighbor, I've got to love them. I just got to get practical about it. And just for me, that is just one way God has been asking me to come to repentance. You know, the beautiful thing about, about growing in understanding, having our eyes enlightened and, and, and from a scriptural perspective is that he said, we don't have to become so spiritual that we ignore the realities that we are faced with. In Acts, um, Paul speaks about his journey that he had as a prisoner. He was on his way to Rome. And then what's happening is that in the storm, right, they're confronted with this storm. And um, Paul says, when neither sun nor stars appeared, well, Luke rather, when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, right, they were on this ship for many days and the storm comes against them and no small tempest lay on us all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned all right so these guys for a certain period of time their their their, their knowledge of the sea gave him hope hey we can get through this you know the strength of the the sailors and the soldiers it, it gave them hope we can get through this we've seen bad storms we can make this we're going to make it to rome and then eventually things just got out of hand. Eventually things just for days, in actual fact for weeks, the storm was buffeting them. And there was no way out in the natural the storm. You know what Paul did? Paul didn't get onto that boat, didn't stand up and say, Hey guys, you know what? This storm, it's in your mind. It's simply in your mind. Just, just focus. Don't worry about being seasick. Don't worry about 
you know, uh, uh, your thirst and your hunger, not having seen the sun or the stars for 14 days. It's all in your mind, man. Just let us sing louder. Let's sing above the storm and it's all going to be okay when we open up our eyes. No, there was something more. There was, a, there was a hope inside of Paul that was real. I was reading this book a while ago by Jim Collins called Good to Great. He speaks about the Stockdale Paradox, right? And, and Admiral Stockdale was shot down during the Vietnam War, prison of war for seven or eight years. And he said the following. I just quickly want to read this for you. It's such a powerful quote. He says that you must never confuse faith that you will prevail in the end, a faith which you can never afford to lose, never confuse that with a discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, whatever they might be. And I, I found that when we go through times like we've gone through now and, and the questions become overwhelming, we tend to do a, a couple of things. Um, uh, Toynbee, the well-known historian, he says that when people are confronted with difficulties, they either retreat into the past, so all they want to do is they want to wait till things get back to what it was, or they daydream just that things will get better automatically, and so they, they, they hours get lost through daydreaming. Nowadays, I suppose, we would spend that time just on social media as a measure of daydreaming. Uh, some people retreat within themselves and they wait for others to come and rescue them. Whereas there are other people who face the facts and they are able to grow and learn and to flourish. Sometimes because and in spite of those difficulties. And this is what Paul does. He's in that storm, right? It's a massive storm. The storm is about to, to kill them all. That's the reality. But something happens when we live with hope. Something happens and when we live with Christ, the hope of glory inside of us, as Colossians says, that, that, that there is something that happens inside of us. God gives us a voice. God gives us a voice. And so Paul, in the midst of the hopelessness, he gets a voice. And listen to what he, to what he says here. Since they had been without food for a long time. We can relate to that, can't we? Without food for a long time. We've been without many stuff for a long time, eh? A lot of stuff. What's, what's that thing that you have been without? Within that drought, within that famine, within that storm, Paul stands up and he says, Men, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. So he confronts the brutal facts. He says, Guys, you should have listened. This is a mess. We're in the situation because it is a mess. We're in the situation, maybe not so much because of COVID, but because of the decisions that we have made. Or we're in this mess, yes, because of decisions other people have made. Or we're in this mess because my business partner messed up. Or we're in this mess because I broke a promise to my wife. Or we're in this mess because I betrayed a friend. Or we are in this mess because I didn't fill in my taxes. Or we're in this mess, whatever the situation might be, face the mess face the mess. Don't, don't skirt around it. But then he says to them so beautifully, yet now, yet now I urge you, and this is my message to us as we finish up, I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. He says your life will not be lost. You will lose the ship, and there are a lot of cargo on that ship. All right, and so they lose the ship. He says, things will not turn out the way that you necessarily thought that it would. You will be losing some things. You know, and sometimes within the charismatic Christian uh, life that we live, we don't deal too well with loss. The power of the gospel is exactly this, that within loss, within losing the ship, there is hope. He says, your life will be saved for this very night. They stood before me, an angel of the Lord. No, no. For this very night, they stood before me, an angel of the God. And I love this. To whom I belong and whom I serve. Man, come on. They stood before me, an angel of the God, to whom I belong and whom I serve. The word comes from the God to whom you belong and whom you serve. And so the bigger question really is, do you belong to God and do you serve Him? 
That's the biggest question. And if you belong to God and if you serve Him, it really doesn't matter what happens to the ship. God will get you to where you need to be. Amen. He will get you to where you need to be. And He says to them, do not be afraid. This angel said to me, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. Do not be afraid, John, Sue, Sarah. David, patience, do not be afraid because you will stand before the person that God has destined you to stand before if you are serving Him. Paul's heart was set to get to Rome just to be obedient to God. And he says, you are lined, in line with my will, you will get to where you need to get. Behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. And that spoke to me so much. So yes, Paul, there's a promise to him that he's going to be okay. But the angel goes further and the angel says to him, God has granted you the lives of these men. A little bit later on, the, the sailors want to escape. And Paul, Paul says, no, no, these guys shouldn't escape. They're going to die. We need to keep them on the boat. Paul had a heart for, for everyone on the boat. Who's in the boat with you? For me right now, God is speaking to me about my neighborhood. They're in the boat with me. God wants to grant us the lives of those on the ship with us. And in a moment and in a season where people have been without food for a long time, there's a desperation for voices of hope. Church, if we are going to have hope, it's alive inside of us. Christ, not an event, not a program, but a person, hope that God is with us then God is going to increase our influence because the world needs that. I want you to have a quick look at this video clip. It comes from the movie, The Lord of the Rings. It spoke to my heart so much. And it's about this journey that these friends have been on. They're chasing this band of Uruguay, all right? This, this, these guys who have captured their friends and they come across these riders. And we're going to have a quick look at, at what happens here. Business. There's an elf, a man, and a dwarf having the riddle mark. Speak quickly. Give me your name, Horsemaster, and I shall give you mine. I would cut off your head, dwarf, if it stood but a little higher from the ground. You would die before your stroke fell. I am Aragorn, son of Aragorn. This is Gimli, son of Gloin, and Legolas of the Woodland Realm. We are friends of Rohan, and of Theoden, your king. Theoden no longer recognizes friend from foe. Not even his own kin. Saruman has poisoned the mind of the king and claimed lordship over these lands. My company are those loyal to Rohan. And for that, we are banished. The white wizard is cunning. He walks here and there, they say. There's an old man, hooded and cloaked. And everywhere his spies slip past our nets. We are no spies. We track a party of Urukai westward across the plain. They've taken two of our friends captive. <laughs> the Uruks are destroyed. We slaughtered them during the night. But there were two hobbits. Do you see two hobbits with them? They would be small. Only children to your eyes. We left none alive. We piled the carcasses and burned them. Dead. May these horses bear you to better fortune than their former masters. Farewell. Look for your friends, but do not trust to hope. It has forsaken these lands. Look for your friends, but don't dare to hope. For hope has forsaken these lands. 
you know, I'm, I'm looking out here over the Yaldeberg and I'm, and I'm thinking about how many, how many friends have we lost, you know, spiritually? How many friends have been taken captive? How many family members, how many colleagues have been taken captive by the forces of darkness? Will we go in pursuit? But in a landscape that as beautiful as it is, have lost hope. You just have to go onto Facebook to see how much hope people have lost. Will we pursue our friends with God's love and with God's hope? I believe that God is holding before us a window of opportunity church as hopeful people, as hopeful people to invade the Yaldeberg with hope, to flood the Yaldeberg with hope. So take heart, men and women of God, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. I have faith in God. I want to ask you that you will join with me as I extend my hands and pray for the Yaldeberg, that you would stand in faith with me, that God through us, because that's the reality, if hope is going to come to this beautiful place in which we live, Hope is going to have to come through me and through you. Father, I thank you that you have placed us here. God, as I look out, Lord, over this beautiful valley, I thank you for Solari Pass Village. Thank you for Somerset West. Thank you, Lord, for Asanda Village, for Gordons Bay, for Strand. God, I thank you for Makassar that we can see as well. God, and I thank you, Lord, for this entire area. Lord, where our people live. And I pray that you will flood as the rain has come and as the rain has flooded so many parts of this, this area, Lord, that you will flood our neighborhoods with hope. We thank you for Christ, the hope of glory that lives inside of us. And we ask God, rise up inside of us, Lord, and be the hope through us. Give us a heart for the people on the ship with us and enable us, Lord, to be the voice of hope in the midst of the desperation around us. I pray that my brothers and sisters will take heart and know that it will be as you have told us it will be. In Jesus' name, Amen. If you need prayer, if you have lost hope, if there's an area in your life that you know you need to repent of, as I needed to repent, and I want to ask you, please phone us as elders, the numbers will be on the screen phone us. We would love to pray with you. And if you have questions that you are struggling with, don't struggle through them on your own. We are here to come alongside you and to help you in whichever way we can. Love the Lord with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. And be bold and love your neighbor as yourself. God bless you. Bye-bye. Bye.